Hi everybody, welcome back. If you are new, hi, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So for our second video of No Trace November, we are diving into a case that I have not been able to stop thinking about. I covered the case of Barbara Louise Cotton a few months back and Lisa Sheila, the woman who helped me so much with my video and the woman who keeps Barbara's case going, had emailed me recently and mentioned the case we were covering today. She put me in contact with the victim's first cousin once removed, Julian Quaterio, who is the main person keeping this case going. And I spoke with them back and forth through email to make sure I got all of my information correct. Lisa and Julian have done so much work when it comes to this case and it is honestly an honor for them to even consider me to cover it. With all that being said, let's get right into it. This is the disappearance of Judith Ann Brown. Judith Ann Brown, nicknamed Judy, was born on November 14th of 1957 to Eugene and Vanda Brown in New York City. She was the third born of what would be eight children. She had five sisters and two brothers. Judy was described as being a very kind and quiet child growing up. She stayed away from the troublemakers, she didn't get involved in drama, and she wasn't one to disrespect adults. The model student would graduate from Evander Childs High School in the Bronx. Judy was overall a good kid with a conventionally normal upbringing, but it was when she entered her teenage years, it became apparent to her loved ones that she was struggling mentally. The change in her was gradual, but from how she was during her younger years to how she was during her late teenage years, it was definitely a drastic change. It is unknown exactly what she would be diagnosed with, but to paint a clearer picture for you all, she showed signs of obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, and depression. It was not severe enough to where she could not function in her everyday life, but at times she was overtaken by what she was dealing with mentally. It had developed in her early teen years and progressed from there. The brain is complex and sometimes haywires a little bit. For instance, not every serial killer had a devastating and abusive childhood. Sometimes the brain does things we do not understand. For Judy, we do know she had one event happen in her life that would cause someone trauma. And that was in 1965 when her father was walking down the street and was hit by a vehicle. The driver of the vehicle was under the influence. He was drunk. The father survived, but had brain damage as a result of hitting a tree head first after being struck by the vehicle. This is of course something that would have affected Judy mentally. Watching a close loved one go from being full of life to someone confined to a bed, barely able to speak. Is this event what caused her to mentally spiral? We do not know, but it is something to take into consideration. Like I stated before, Judy had two older siblings and when they got to the age where they were able to move out of the family home, they did. And this unfortunately left Judy with a lot of responsibility. Her mother was consistently working. Her father was trying to find work after everything he went through because of the accident. And she had to help take care of her five younger siblings. She grew up fast. Now, the Brown family was originally from New York, but they started facing financial struggles and decided to move to Kansas. They had inherited a farm in Coldwater and due to how difficult it was becoming to make ends meet in the Big Apple, they decided making this move would be the best option for them. While her family moved hundreds of miles away, Judy decided to stay behind in the place she called home. Judy was a city girl. She did not want to move to a rural community in Kansas with a population of roughly a thousand people. So she went to live in Flushing, Queens with her aunt on her mother's side of the family, her aunt's husband and their seven children. So she went from one large family to another and growing up, she was always extremely close with her cousins. When she moved into their home, they welcomed her with open arms. Judy had struggled mentally for years, but it was really when she started college at LaGuardia Community College that these mental health issues took an immense toll on her. She was no longer able to push them down and focus on the things she needed to get done academically. Judy would go on to have what you would describe as a mental breakdown, possibly a panic attack during one of her classes. If you have ever endured a mental breakdown, a nervous breakdown, a panic attack, anything along those lines, you know how severe they can be. It 
genuinely feels like you're having a heart attack. Judy decided that she needed to seek medical help immediately. On August 3rd of 1976, her cousin Maureen and one of her professors drove her to Creedmoor Psychiatric Center in Queens Village, Queens, New York. The facility provides both inpatient and outpatient programs, and Judy decided to voluntarily check herself in for the inpatient program. She was not there very long before being discharged, and her aunt and uncle came to pick her up and bring her to another psychiatric facility, Hillside Hospital in Glen Oaks, Queens, to further her treatment. Judy would be there for inpatient for about two to three months. After being discharged from Hillside's inpatient program, she would enter their outpatient program. And through this outpatient program, she was actually provided housing in Kew Gardens. So she moved out of her aunt and uncle's home and began living there. To live in these apartments though, through Hillside Hospital, you had to continue any therapy sessions they recommended you do. So that's what she did. She lived in an apartment provided by the hospital and continued her therapy. We do know that on top of therapy, she was taking multiple medications medications, one of these medications being Valium, which is an anti-anxiety medication classified as a benzodiazepine. It was 1977, Judy was 19 years old and was living on her own away from her family for the first time in her life. She was on new medication and she was attending therapy sessions. Her life was far different than she expected it to be the year prior. On top of all of this, she was seeing a man a man she had met during her short time at Creedmoor Psychiatric Center. Shortly before her disappearance, she sent a letter to her family in Kansas stating that she and this new man were engaged and going to be marrying very soon in a Unitarian church. This man's name was Richard Riesenberg, who I must mention was 11 years Judy senior. He was 30 years old when she was 19 still a teenager. Richard E. Riesenberg was a patient at Creedmoor for a reason we do not believe Judy knew at the time. The reason for Richard being at Creedmoor? Well, we're gonna backtrack a little bit. A little after 6.30 p.m. on January 10th of 1971, 24-year-old Richard gruesomely murdered his wife, Diane, and their 17-month-old son, Andrew, at their home on 74th Avenue in Glen Oaks. He stabbed Diane approximately 60 times and strangled Andrew to death with an extension cord after taping his mouth shut. Richard stabbed Diane with such force that some of her fingers were severed from her hand. Richard did not immediately admit to the murders, so police initially thought it could have been a targeted attack on the Riesenberg family or a robbery gone wrong. Richard called authorities and told them he got home from work and just found them like that and that he was in complete shock over it. At the time, Richard was an airline catering supervisor working for JFK Airport, and police would find the murder weapons disposed in the garbage at JFK Airport. In a paper bag, they found the knife used to kill Diane, the extension cord used to kill Andrew, and a pair of underwear. Police knew because of that that they had their man and arrested him at his parents' home five days after the murders on January 15th. During the investigation, a lot of information was uncovered when it came to Richard during and before his marriage to Diane. It was discovered that Richard had suffered from severe mental health issues for years. It started when he was a young child displaying immense behavioral concerns. And then on two separate occasions before he even turned 15, he had tried to take his own life. During adolescence, he would be diagnosed with schizoid personality with a possible onset of schizophrenic disorder. He had an IQ of 141, but even with how book smart he was, he was never able to finish his schooling due to his mental health. When it comes to his marriage to Diane, we know that there were problems pretty much right off the bat considering he was Jewish and she was not, and there were extreme religious differences. We also know that Diane had suffered from cataracts, causing her to slowly go blind. Their son, Andrew, was also developmentally challenged. It seems like instead of being an understanding and compassionate husband and father, Richard found these things to be more of a burden than anything else. According to neighbors, Richard would have multiple affairs during his marriage to Diane. We do not know exactly what was going on in his head, but whatever it was caused him to take the life of two innocent individuals. The two main people in his life he should have protected. 
At first, a psychiatric evaluation was done at Kings County Hospital, and it deemed Richard unfit to stand trial for the murders. From there, he spent a year at Matawan State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Dutchess County, New York. Matawan Hospital would coincidentally close January 1st of 1977, the beginning of the same year that Richard and Judy would vanish. Then he was sent to Creedmoor. At Creedmoor, another psychiatric evaluation would be conducted on him, and this time they found him fit to stand trial. Richard, though, would be found not guilty in 1973 by reason of insanity. Even though everyone knew he took the life of his wife and son because he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, he would still go on to receive her life insurance, which was a little over $10,000. From there, he was sent back to Creedmoor to continue his treatment. The overall goal for them was to help him enough mentally to a point where they could rehabilitate him and release him back into society. The plan was not to have him there for his entire life, which I think he should have been, and in my opinion, based on his crime, he should not have been allowed to be near people like Judy, who were there for simply having a mental breakdown and needing some psychiatric help. Now, I want to talk about Creedmoor for a moment. From my understanding of how it is today, I'm not sure how every single mental health facility is, but once you check in for inpatient, you're there. You cannot just leave as you please. You sleep there, you have all your three meals and a snack there, and those other patients there become your neighbors. You are only able to leave for an emergency to be taken to the hospital, or if they let you outside for fresh air, or some places even have smoke breaks. Well, at Creedmoor, like other places, it became your home where you slept and ate and received mental help, but you were able to come and go as you please, and that is exactly what Richard did. If Richard wanted to attend a Mets game at Shea Stadium, he would. If he wanted to grab some lunch at the Hillside Diner, he would. They had an open gate policy. It is believed that because he was able to leave the facility when he chose to, he was able to spend time with Judy when he chose, and this is how they were able to become close after she left Creedmoor. According to the Daily News, after only a year of being at Creedmoor, Richard submitted an application to be released. He thought he had a chance considering how cooperative he was while being at the facility. He worked at the community store for a bit of time after arriving there, and then he was put in charge of the hospital's hot shop due to his experience with food catering. Alfred Annenberg, a former assistant attorney general who then became head of the Forensic Bureau of the Queens District Attorney's Office, argued Richard's release, and the judge agreed. Richard's release application was denied and would be denied again when he reapplied in 1975. There have been several unsolved murders popping up in a very short period of time around the area. This isn't very uncommon for New York. The crime rate is quite high, but the New York Police Department started looking at Richard, that possibly he had been murdering people during his outings from the hospital. They questioned him, and he would ultimately be crossed off the suspect list in all of these cases, but they felt like someone who committed a double murder should not be able to walk freely around the streets of New York or freely around anywhere. After the NYPD and the Queens District Attorney got to thinking about how Creedmoor was planning on eventually releasing Richard back to the public, and he had all this freedom there, they decided they needed to move him to another facility. They wanted to send him to the Mid-Hudson Forensic Psychiatric Center, a maximum security hospital in New Hampton, New York, after the place was recommended to them by a supervisor at Creedmoor. It is believed that someone at Creedmoor, we don't know who, told Richard this little bit of information that the NYPD and the Queens District Attorney were planning on moving him elsewhere. Obviously, Richard would not have liked that. He had so much freedom at Creedmoor, he did not want to be moved to a place where he would have been on a stricter watch with less privileges. So he decided to flee New York, but he wasn't going to leave without his fiance, which is where Judy's disappearance comes into play. Judy and Richard's whereabouts to this day are completely unknown. Regarding their disappearance, of course, we are primarily focusing on Judy. She is the true victim here. Here is what we know. Judy left her apartment in Glen Oaks and Richard left Creedmoor together in late April of 1977. 
Some newspaper articles claim that the exact date was April 21st. Judy's family did not know she had left until authorities came knocking on their door regarding her fiance's disappearance from Creedmoor. Based on the research Lisa and Julian have done, the last known contact Judy had with anyone in her family was when she phoned one of her sisters shortly after leaving. She told her that she was okay. She wouldn't say much else, and then she said that she had to go. It was a very short conversation, and Judy's sister stated that, from what she could tell, Judy wanted to be with Richard. We also know that Richard phoned his family around the same time to tell them that he was starting a new life. We know that the FBI was still looking for Richard up until at least 1984, because that is when Richard's father passed, and members of the FBI were actually in attendance of the funeral in case Richard showed up. He did not. That would have been seven years after Judy and Richard left the area. Strangely though, sometime in the 1990s, Richard had actually contacted a lawyer. He was experiencing some health issues and wanted to seek help at a hospital back in New York City, but he wanted to see about clearing up some legal issues he had previously before he checked himself into a hospital in the state of New York. According to an article by the Daily News released on August 21st of 1983, Alfred Ennenberg claimed that a few years prior, Creedmoor had actually received a call from a man who identified himself as Richard Riesenberg. He stated that he was in California, laughed and hung up. He never called back. Whether this was Richard or not, or just a prank call, we don't know. There have been articles written on Richard and his disappearance because of course he is a wanted fugitive, but these articles either do not mention Judy at all, or they simply mention her as his 19 year old girlfriend that he fled with. Law enforcement and the media barely focused on the actual victim at hand, Judy. She was a young girl who was struggling mentally and based on Richard's track record, she was most likely extremely manipulated by the murderer and chances are she had no idea what he even did to end up at Creedmoor. It was not until the year of 2009 when Judy would be finally classified as a missing person and the NYPD cold case unit did not officially open her case until 2012. That is roughly 35 years after she left. Julian has had very little help when it comes to speaking to the cold case detective assigned to Judy's case. Julian has no idea whether they have files and files and files of information on the case or no file at all. Yes, Judy is missing and her family desperately wants to know what happened to her, but for all we know, they could view it as a situation where it's somebody who simply doesn't want to be found. Due to the amount of research Julian has done on this case, even though he has never met his cousin because he was born after she left, he feels like he truly knows her. He didn't just collect information regarding her disappearance. He really tried to learn as much as he could about her life before she left, her personality, her interests. He wanted to know everything there was to know about her, not just about the mystery surrounding her. Due to the phone call Judy made to her sister, it is believed that Judy left with Richard voluntarily. Of course, after they left Queens, there could be hundreds of different scenarios when it comes to what happened, but there are two main theories in this case. The first one being that Richard ended up taking Judy's life sometime after they left, and then he lived out his life in another state or possibly traveled around to different states after he disposed of her remains somewhere, and these remains have just never been located. The second theory is that possibly they are still out there together somewhere. If they both lived this entire time and broke up at some point, it is near unbelievable that she would have never reached out to her family at some point. If still alive, Richard would be 77 years old and Judy would be 65 years old. When I said that if she was killed or died since they left, that her remains have most likely never been located, that is because if she was a Jane Doe found somewhere, chances are her DNA may be in a genetic database, unless of course she was possibly cremated beforehand. And some of Judy's relatives have submitted their DNA into different genetic databases. We know that they have looked into NamUs, CODIS, and GEDmatch. Some of Richard's close relatives have also submitted their DNA into different databases, and there has never been a match for him either. 
There has never been a match for Judy or Richard or anyone on the site that may be one of their children if they ever went on to have any. Could there be a match one day? That is a possibility. But until then, or until one of them comes forward, if either of them are still alive out there somewhere, or until someone else comes forward with new information, we unfortunately do not know. Judith Ann Brown today would be 65 years old. In 1977, she stood between five feet, two inches tall and five feet, six inches tall. She weighed between 110 to 130 pounds. She had sandy brown hair and green eyes. She had an extra tooth on the bottom front row. If you have any information regarding her or Richard's disappearance, you are urged to contact the New York City Missing Persons Squad at 212 six nine four seven seven eight one if you want to follow the case for future updates you can like the facebook page for the case at facebook.com slash judith ann brown missing i will have the page linked in the description of this video as well i show sympathy for the cases i cover always but i rarely am extremely vulnerable here on my channel but I'm gonna be a little vulnerable for this one. As someone who has been in a mental health facility before due to a mental breakdown, just like Judy, a few, I know how lonely it can become mentally. Even if you have friends and family around you, sometimes you feel like no one from your personal life understands you. And then you go into a place like that and you feel like everyone kind of gets it. You will meet people who know what it's like to be struggling mentally and be scared and feel isolated. You cling to people you feel like possibly understand you the most. And that could be exactly what Judy did. She met Richard, this man who was older and seemed wiser and made her feel like he could relate to her on a deeper level. She maybe would have done anything to not lose someone like that even leaving her life behind, not knowing she was putting herself in danger. We also have to take into consideration that both of them were on medication for quite some time. If they were leaving the area without a primary care doctor to continue prescribing the medication, how were they going to continue their medication? Especially Richard, who was most likely on medication for years. Quitting medication cold turkey like that can be detrimental. The mental and physical side effects can be terrifying. It can end in death. This is also something to think about in my opinion. I'm just saying that there are a lot of factors in this situation to take into consideration for how it could have ended horribly. At the end of the day though, Judy's family just wants answers. This case is 46 years old. Did something horrifying happen to Judy not long after she left? Was she alive for a long period of time afterwards and then something happened? Is she possibly still out there somewhere living under a different name? We don't know, but these are questions that have answers. It's just the point of finding those answers out. They have tried so hard to find out any more information regarding Judy's disappearance, especially having the desire to before her mother passed away. But unfortunately, Judy's mother passed this past September on the third of the month at the age of 91. She passed away never knowing what happened to the daughter that she loved so dearly. So that is all the information that I have for you all today regarding the disappearance of Judith Ann Brown. And I wanted to say a huge thank you to Lisa and Julian for the help when it came to my research for this video. Any sources of mine or pages to follow in relation to this case will be linked down below in the description of this video. Thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about this case. If there are any cases you possibly want me to cover during this month of No Trace November, make sure to send those requests over to gabulosis case requests at gmail.com. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and I will see you all in the next one.